Okay, to some extent, modeling the atmosphere and modeling the ocean are similar because they're both fluids, they obey the same laws of physics. Um, but now, the other, the other part of the, land, of the surface of the Earth is land and the interactions with soil and vegetation involves a whole different set of processes. And uh, one of the world experts on that is, is Professor Robert Dickinson, who uh, is a PhD from MIT back in 1966, and since then has had a, a very distinguished career. He's a member of both the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, has an, is very active in, uh, in science assessment and, and uh, science policy. Um, Professor Dickinson? He ended up at the University of Texas, but I'm not holding that against him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I thought I'd summarize a little bit my background behind what John said, uh, and we'll repeat what he said. But anyway, I started out working on, as everybody at MIT did at the time, on global atmospheric dynamics, either the global or not so global, but it was all atmospheric dynamics. And I took up steady climate in the early 70s when I was at NCAR, and we realized that climate was an important topic that not much was being done about. And got into in the 70s, already there was a lot of conferences and papers about climate change and how well the models were doing it. So this is not a new topic. It's uh, been around for nearly 50 years. Um, in the late 70s uh, um, at NCAR, I got involved with the climate modeling and noticed that the land was the worst part of the climate model. So I was attracted to uh, maybe I could do something about that. So I've been focusing on that ever since. I, I did some other things too, like planetary atmospheres for, for a bit, but um, that's been my primary career uh, since 1980 anyway. And that's what got me elected to National Academy, uh, um, Academy of Engineering, putting vegetation into climate models. The uh, dynamics got me into the uh, um, National Academy of Science. Okay. So I've got a couple of simple messages that you might keep in mind as I go through things. Um, what happens at the land boundary is important for weather and climate, as well as we all know the uh, obvious converse of um, whether the climate's important for what goes on at land. And land uh, consists of a lot of things, but some of the key things are the vegetation. Um, and a, a key question that we've been working on lately, and I'll get back to, is uh, droughts as a very important example of land atmosphere coupling that we really don't know nearly as much about yet as we, we ought to. And I think there's rapid progress is being made, and John's been doing some of that, and will continue to be made over the next decade or so. Okay. So I'm going over two topics. I'm quickly going through an overview of some of the key land processes that you want to think more about, and then talk a little bit about new advances in understanding drought. Okay, so land occurs. Um, even on even more scales than the atmospheric processes do. And we have to start at molecular cellular level because we're very, one part of land is we're very much concerned about carbon cycling. And how, okay, so what's carbon cycling? The, um, it, it gets initiated, the concern because of humans putting CO2 into the atmosphere, but then that doesn't all stay in the atmosphere. About half of it goes in the oceans and land. And what goes into land is maybe about a quarter, but it's <coughs> been difficult to quantify it. So it's been, it still is called the, the missing sink. Um, so there's been a lot of work over the last decade in, in, in understanding the, the, the carbon cycle. And you start at the molecular cellular level of the um, chloroplasts that take in the CO2, and we've got models for that that go into climate models now. And we worry about things at leaf level, how the radiation is absorbed um, coming down from the sun and, and canopy level, and then we go up to all the scales and into climate and global. Okay, next. This is a little more about leaf level. This is from a, a review paper I did a long time ago. Um, main point being made here is that the reflection of light from leaves um, in a canopy is not the, at all the same as reflection of light just from a single leaf. And that's because the light trapping properties of a canopy, a lot of the reflected light that comes off a leaf gets hits the bottom of other leaves. So you end up with a total reflection only being about half of what it would be if you had just a single leaf for a canopy. 
Okay, go on. Okay, there's a little bit about the CO2 um, modeling that's done where the, um, currently the models include both the CO2 and the water as, as one, one uh, set of calculations. So, okay, so water is the uh, um, transpiration. Okay, so of course water is very important for our, cl our climate and, and for people in general. Um, where there's water, you have vegetation, and where there's vegetation, much of the water that comes from the cell going back into the atmosphere goes through the leaves and, and through, through, through the stomates in the leaves. And, and that's probably an accident of the fact the leaves have been developed to take the CO2 in and, and move it to the chloroplast. There's a little bit about the uh, modeling of the of, of, uh, carbon assimilation uh, photosynthesis. Okay, go on. Okay, and that goes up the, the global carbon sc cycle scale, um, where we worry about land and atmospheres and uh, exchanges. I guess sort of the main message here is that the natural cycles are quite a bit bigger than, than what humans are doing to carbon, except that they have been more or less balanced. So human injection of CO2 in the atmosphere sort of that has unbalanced them and, and driven the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere up to unprecedented levels. Okay, so. When I started uh, worrying about CO2, it was 320 parts per million, now it's 400 parts per million. So it's, at least in my scientific career, it's uh, gone, gone that far. Um, next. And this is part of, just to remind you of, of we, we try to model the whole Earth system and everything coupled. So we've got the ocean and the land and the atmosphere and they all uh, run together in these complicated uh, um, climate models that we have. Okay. And we have to, and maybe Charles will say more about this, we have to try to evaluate all these processes and how well they're working. And um, I guess sort of a summary is I, when I got into the, these models in the 70s, we thought they were already working fairly well, but um, they're working much better now, but they're still not working well enough. I can see that. <laughs> um, okay, go on. And, Part of the uh, complication of carbon is that we also have to couple it to nitrogen cycling because nitrogen is a very key nutrient for plants and tied into it's in the um, enzymes uh, um, which which make the, the leaves and the plant function um, require nitrogen and we have lots of parts of the plant that the carbon goes in so taking it into leaves is just part of the story we have to worry about going into all kinds of parts of the plant and storage pools and so on. And then it dies and goes to the ground and comes back up again. That's a sort of summary, very quick summary of carbon cycle and nitrogen cycling. Okay, go on. And humans have had a big impact on uh, land uh, cover and, and through that affected the carbon cycle. So historically, um, there's been almost as much carbon put in the atmosphere by changing land use as by burning fossil fuels. It just has been mostly historically happened a um, you know, century ago, and so maybe less of what's in the atmosphere now has been affected by, by land use change. Next. Okay, so now I turn to drought as an issue, and maybe we'll be a, a little slower on this. Um, we frequently, as we all of you have noticed, have drought in Texas. <coughs> and uh, frequently have spring drought leading to summer drought. The 211 drought was an example. Oh, I should mention that you can think of drought uh, seasonally. There's winter, spring, summer. I don't hear much about fall drought, but I guess we have fall drought too. And anyway, the, the winter drought is um, most strongly driven by the sea surface temperature anomalies that Sir Vannon talked about, uh, the El Nino. Uh, it has a, a footprint of patterns of rainfall all over the U.S. when you have El Nino or the opposite uh, version, the La Nina. But uh, there's much weaker dependence on ocean temperatures for, for what happens in the summertime. So the summer is much more of a mystery um, currently. And we frequently in, um, see spring drought leading into summer drought. Okay, what makes this interesting, especially as it's not captured by, by the current climate models or seasonal forecasts. The uh, um, NOAA can't, can't start with spring drought and tell you there's gonna be summer drought or not summer drought. But there's observational evidence showing that this does happen. So something is missing or misrepresented in the models. Okay. 
Okay, so let's just sort of show you uh, 211 drought, a picture from it that killed a lot of trees, which uh, sort of again gets the, the uh, impact of the climate on, on, on the vegetation and it couples back um, to the atmosphere. Okay. So I'll just spend my last couple of minutes talking about um, sort of applying my MIT education, which was learning how to do atmospheric dynamics, to coming up with. Um, we used to call them simple models, but now we call them toy models because they're not really um, have a lot of predictive value, but they have educational value in trying to demonstrate how everything fits together in a way that uh, um, gives you some insight in, into the processes involved. So there's uh, from a, okay, so land by itself is, is um, unlike the uh, ocean and atmosphere, is not a fluid. It's, uh, um, John mentioned, but it's very complex and has many scales and many processes. Okay, we get to uh, the atmosphere, then there's a few key concepts that I learned at MIT. Uh, they involved uh, um, vorticity and energy, so that uh, vorticity generation and loss is one key principle that one can put in the model, and en thermal energy generation and loss is another one. These, I did models, I think, 50 years ago, all of these two things. Okay, so you can start with a negative anomaly in atmospheric heating, which is what you'd have if you have a lack of rainfall, latent heating, or another mechanism is uh, through the uh, uh, long wave, uh, the thermal infrared heating. Um, you have clouds and, and they heat the atmosphere by the capturing the radiation coming from below. If you don't have clouds, you don't have that. So. That's another negative uh, heating anomaly. And these produce an atmospheric circulation that uh, is similar to what occurs in a drought. And, and you can show it provides positive feedback to, to maintain itself. So that was a, sort of a thing I'm excited about now in terms of trying to do research and understand something that's important and seems to be poorly understood. Okay, thank you.